question and answer session. Before we begin, as we launch into the presentations, I want to start by sharing participation guidelines with you. As you may have noticed, as participants, you will be in mute mode throughout the webinar. However, there are a number of ways to participate actively. Between each presentation, we will offer brief polling questions that will be flashed on the screen for about 20 seconds, give you a chance to quickly respond, and then we will show that response before we move on to the next presentation. So please do participate in the polling questions. At the end of the webinar, as I mentioned, we will also have a question and answer session. In anticipation of that, you will note that you are able to enter questions in the chat box on the right of your screen. These will be addressed as we're able to through the question and answer session. Finally, you can follow and respond to this webinar on Twitter at number pre-K third. So here we go. Today, this is the third in an eight-part webinar series. For the full schedule, you can visit our website, which is listed on the screen. Our focus is on family engagement. As the presenters move forward, we will provide perspectives from researchers, local groups, and school districts on how to build partnerships between families and schools with a specific emphasis on the very early years of education, pre-K through third grade. As we do that, just to give a brief overview, as many of you know, in considering a pre-K through third approach, one of our big challenges and opportunities is to really build a special pre-K through third culture. An important part of this is a commitment to collaborative forms of professionalism as we really try to weave together the cultures of early childhood and K-12 education and combine those cultures in a pre-K third approach. A very essential part of this is to extend this thinking about collaboration and collaborative ways of working to our ways of relating with children's and children and families. One thing you'll note today as we move through the webinar is <clears throat> excuse me, the terms parent involvement, parent education are being dropped in favor of the term family engagement. This is not just new jargon for our same way, old ways of doing business, but really represent a whole new outlook on how we can and must engage families in our work as educators. In my experience, both as a teacher educator and a school administrator, there are a few topics that arouse as much passion, both positive and negative often, as the topic of working with families. I think this passion definitely will show through as we work across the presentations in today's webinar and as we also see evidence of the benefits for all of us weaving across all of the presentations today. So with this in mind, let's move forward with a quick polling question and start our first presentation. As we wait for those results, oh, there they are, um, you can see that we have teachers and administrators at both the early childhood elementary levels, followed by family engagement coordinators and outreach coordinators, and then it looks like a wealth of other individuals with us today. That's terrific. Um, we have the pleasure with our first presentation in having Christine Patton with us to set the stage for thinking about family engagement, family school partnerships. Christine is the Senior Research Analyst for the Harvard Family Research Project. So welcome, Christine. Thanks, Chris, and thank you all for being here. So my goal for the next 10 minutes or so is to set the stage for my co-presenters by grounding their work in a larger body of knowledge and research related to family engagement. And I also hope that this stage setting will prompt an action or a reaction from you all in the audience in relation to the work that you are currently doing or are thinking about doing with families. So I want to start by making three points. 
One, children learn in multiple spaces. So they learn in the classrooms and auditoriums of their schools. They learn in the living rooms and backyards of their homes. They learn on websites and by engaging with apps on mobile devices. And they learn in museums and aquariums and in an array of other community settings. While the focus of this webinar is the bridge between the home space and the school space, for schools wishing to engage in partnerships with families, they must be willing to talk to families about the multiple places in which children learn, and they must be willing to engage with the resources and personnel in these other settings in order to enhance children's learning. Point two, children learn from multiple teachers. All of the multiple spaces I just mentioned have their own form of educators within them. And point three, family engagement is more than a one-time project or an add-on effort. So these three points are reflective of a larger reframing of families and the work that we do with them. In this reframing, families are not viewed as bystanders that passively receive ideas from educators. Rather, within this reframing, working with families is viewed as a shared responsibility among all of the adults in a child's life. So this represents a shift away from an attitude of blame and an it's your fault mentality to a we're in this together mentality in which teachers and parents have complementary roles. The second element in this reframing lies in understanding that family engagement is continuous across the lifespan. So we often think about working with families in early childhood or kindergarten, but we shouldn't think about it it's this, in this way. It's not something that only happens in these early education spaces. It instead spans from birth to early adulthood. Finally, with this last element, Family engagement is viewed as something that is reinforced in multiple settings where children learn. So with this reframing, by removing the bystander passive recipient label from parents, we position them to take on and be seen in multiple roles. Without this restrictive bystander label, families can be seen as teachers, supporters, data gatherers, partners, leaders, and advocates. And when we partner with families and truly engage with them as partners, as teachers, as data gatherers, and as advocates, everyone benefits. Children benefit, families benefit, and programs and schools benefit. For example, increases in family involvement in school predicts increases in literacy achievement and social skills. And this is especially true for children from low-income families. It's associated with greater school readiness, as reported by teachers on measures of initiative and interpersonal competence in preschool. And for families, when families are actively engaged in their children's learning environments, they share the same language and knowledge of the school's landscape with their children. And this shared meaning can come in the form of shared stories, perhaps from a day when the family member participates in the classroom as a parent mentor, or shared language. So knowing, for example, the name of the disciplinary system that the school uses, or the song that the teacher sings to signal that it's time to clean up, can translate into meaningful discussions in the home and create a bridge between home and school. For families, it's also associated with increased social network and increased social capital. Finally, programs benefit from family engagement as it has been found to be associated with improved school climate, conditions, and policies within the school and at the district level. So to get at these benefits, schools need to commit to partnering with families through the use of interconnected and strategic efforts. So having some state and federal policies in place around family engagement may be one way of jump-starting these efforts. However, schools need to commit to translating these policies into meaningful practices. So promising ways of doing so include having a shared vision of family engagement. So this vision is one that's known and understood by administrators at all levels, teachers and families. It, it, another promising practice is having purposeful connections to learning so that the family engagement efforts are, are not seen as an add-on or something that happens after school or before school. Making investments in high quality programming and staff, so staff who are excited about partnering with families. 
having a robust communication system that cuts across all stakeholders. And finally, having an evaluation system for accountability and continuous learning, one that has data about family engagement, and that data is used to make school-wide decisions and improve practices. So this is just a subset of some promising practices, and you're going to hear more from my co-presenters as we move through this webinar. And some of these promising practices can be found in a resource that I want to highlight, Seeing and is Believing, Promising Practices for How School Districts Promote Family Engagement. And you can go to this resource to see how these promising practices are actually translated in the field. I also want to highlight a couple of more resources here. The first one, Family Engagement in Early Childhood. It's a resource guide that we developed for the Early Learning Challenge grant recipients that wrote to engaging and supporting families. But it can use, be used by anyone with an interest in revamping or continuing to support their family engagement work. Next, the Head Start Parent, Family, and Community Engagement Framework. Then the Family Involvement Network of Educators. It's a quarterly newsletter that highlights the best information about family engagement. And then finally, State Laws on Family Engagement in Education is a reference guide that was developed by PTA about just that, the State Laws on Family Engagement in Education. So I just want to leave you this with these resources to conclude, and I will have my contact information up here on the screen for you, and I will pass it on to the moderator and next co-presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for laying that ex excellent foundation for our consideration of family engagement today. Um, our participants will see on the screen a very quick polling question, again, to have you weigh in as you begin to sit, consider new and different or perhaps um, enhancing some of the strategies you're already using around family engagement. All right, and you will see on the screen, creating a welcoming culture, more than a one-time effort, as Christine talked about, continuous efforts over time, was certainly um, a starting place that most people noted as very critical, following establishing connections very early in children and teachers and schools' lives before we start the kindergarten year. Now, um, we move forward to our second presentation, which comes to us from Mimi Howard. Mimi is the National Head Start Fellow in the Office of Head Start, the Administration for Children and Families in the US, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As you know, Head Start has been a historic pace setter in our connections with children and families. And Mimi will share with us how Head Start is building upon its existing work to promote partnerships as children transition from Head Start programs into school systems. Thank you, Mimi, for joining us. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everybody. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, I want to build, first of all, on what Christine has just laid out for us, and also want to let you know that all of the things that you checked as being important ways of engaging families will be, will be talked about, hopefully, within the next 10 minutes. So here we go. I'm um, wanting to introduce to you a new resource that's recently been developed by the Office of Head Start that's been developed to help programs find effective ways to partner with elementary schools to increase the linkages across their two systems. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the guide itself, which is called Partnerships for Sustained Learning, a guide to creating Head Start school partnerships, and how that can be used to increase continuity across early learning programs and the early grades of elementary school. Then I'll end by spending just a few minutes talking in more depth about how family engagement in particular plays a central role in this guide. So the partnership guide has, um, is, really comes out of a long history of a Head Start having placed a high priority on assuring that the gains that children make in early Head Start in Head Start 
are supported and sustained after they move into elementary school. The Head Start Performance Standards, uh, the new school readiness document entitled The Roadmap to Excellence, and the reauthorization of the Head Start Act in 2007, among others, all lay out very specific expectations for how grantees should be aligning their programs with K-12 education. So although this guide is specifically designed for Head Start programs, it can really be easily used and adapted to the work of any early learning program planning to reach out to and work with partner schools. One of the really unique aspects, I think, of this guide is that it um, helps make it and helps make it relevant to a broad array of programs and settings is the fact that it was designed to be used at the local community-based level. The underlying assumption here is that programs and practices established at the local level by programs and school administrators and staff and families together are best equipped to meet the highly contextualized strengths and needs of families and children in the community and are therefore more likely to be effective and sustainable. So this guide does not provide a recipe for what partnerships should look like or include, but rather provides a menu of very practical, concrete activities and approaches that can be tailored to the unique aspects of any given community. So um, given that sort of caveat, no two partnerships will ever probably look the same, but will instead be reflective of what is important and meaningful to each partnership and within each community. So the partnership guide is um, based on what I'm calling the blueprint for continuity, which provides answers to some of the very basic questions that any program or school would have as they think about moving into creating new partnership agreements or working together at any level. And those questions are first, who should be involved? Secondly, what should be aligned or made continuous? And third, what can we do to make it happen? Or what tools and strategies can help us move this process of building continuity? So first question, who should be involved? Now, I don't think I'm saying anything here that any of you who have already been involved in working across early learning and early grade systems don't know or will find surprising. But establishing partnerships and finding ways to increase continuity across early learning and the early grades is not without its challenges. It requires two very different systems, not traditionally used to working together, to sit at the same table, come to some understanding of how each system works, and begin to explore ways they can begin to work more effectively together. Not an easy task. At the center of this work are the people who need to be involved and who will be faced with the important job of creating new and mutually supportive relationships. So those key drivers for the creation of an aligned or continuous early learning and early grades program are, first, early learning and elementary school administrators, including program directors, school principals, and others who create the conditions and the culture for building continuity across their two systems. Secondly, early learning and elementary school teachers and staff who are the ones who actually put the plans into practice. And finally, but not last, families and caregivers who inform the efforts to meet the needs of individual children and support the continuous learning of children at home and across both systems. So the partnership guide provides practical, as I said, suggestions and concrete examples of how administrators, teachers and staff, and families and caregivers can all work together across these two systems, early learning and the early elementary grades, to make continuity building an ongoing and organic part of school readiness and school improvement efforts. So what should the continuity address? The guide identifies three important components of learning and development that must be addressed by early learning programs and schools hoping to successfully create more continuity for children moving across systems. To assure efforts build continuity and are comprehensive, the guide includes partnership strategies and activities that focus on connecting te teaching practices and learning expectations and environments in order to create similarities that will build on, sustain, and expand children's learning, connecting the delivery of services and assuring that children and families have access to those services as they uh, move from one program to the other, and finally, connecting plans for making the move from early learning programs to school as a key transfer point and opportunity to support school readiness and family engagement. We know this more uh, familiarly as transition. 
just a formatting note here to add is that in each of these three component areas, there are specific included uh, specific suggestions and strategies for how each of the three groups, administrators, teachers, and families can be engaged in the work. Finally, to answer the last question, how can we make this happen? The guide focuses on three mechanisms that are most likely to assure that what is planned and implemented works, that it leads to positive results, and that it can be sustained over time. The three mechanisms are first, the use of joint professional development opportunities and topics that can help to open up communication and build understanding across systems. Second, the creation of common or shared organizational structures like joint planning teams that help to make partnerships permanent and can sustain changes in staff and leadership, and the use of intentional targeted family engagement strategies that meet the needs of individual families and children and build a mindset or culture of shared responsibility across programs and families. So now I just want to say a, a short bit about families and schools and the important roles that family play throughout this guide. Um, the role of families in building more continuous systems is really a recurring theme and a major focus throughout this guide. And as we heard Christine say, constitutes more than a one-time event or an add-on activity. A guiding principle that informed the work of developing the guide was that schools and families share the responsibility for the well-being and school success of children, and therefore families must be equal and full partners in the process of building more continuous systems so that those systems indeed meet the needs of their individual children. To that end, the guide takes sort of a double-pronged approach to family engagement and, the, and provides examples, first of all, of what families can be asked to do or how they can play a role as contributors to continuity building by being involved in some of the activities you, say, you see here on this slide. And secondly, there are examples and strategies for staff to, for how to use family support participation not just in transition, but in areas, all areas of teaching and learning and service delivery as well. And those you will see on the next slide, I have a short list of the ways that schools can be involved in, in supporting families that are addressed in the guide. So there's the list of the, um, some of the kinds of activities that are included in the guide that are uh, provided for school staff and um, administrators to use to, to make sure that parents and families are engaged throughout the whole process. So just now, in conclusion, I just want to let you know that the guide as it uh, exists now is currently undergoing a review and revision process. It is currently in the hands of practitioners and content experts who are examining the content and the format to provide feedback on the usability as well as whether the suggested examples and strategies that are presented in the guide are really appropriate and doable. The revised guide will be available uh, in late summer, just in time for back to school planning. And in the true uh, spirit of collaboration, it's going to be rolled out in partnership with the National Association for Elementary School Principals and the Head Start staff, Office of Head Start together. So, I want to thank you very much for listening and um, pass it back to Chris. All right, thank you so much. And again, we have a uh, quick poll on online ready for responses as you think about actual actions to implement ideas. Um, as you're answering those questions, um, and I thought about both Christine and Mimi's comments, one of the most important points I think they made was as we begin to think about all of these wonderful ideas, approaches, and, and mindsets in working with families, how can we actually make it happen? And both of them, I think, said something that seems relatively simple but is so important, which is um, we can have new policies, we can have laws, um, Head Start can develop um, a planning, really rich planning framework for transitioning families and children across um, Head Start into pre-K third education within schools. But what really is important is what happens at the local level. And it's educators, people like us, who really make things happen by intentionally weaving our actions over time into these frameworks. 
Um, and clearly, all of you, as I look at this polling question, are recognizing, too, that unless we integrate um, action plans within the context of strong relationships, we won't make the progress um, that we know is critically important for pre-K through third. So with that, um, my next pleasure is to introduce Julie Wood as she begins to dig in more deeply around um, practices that live out these um, visions for family engagement in pre-K through third education with a focus on home visiting. Um, Julie is the former implementation administrator for the Harvard Graduate School of Education for three through third, an initiative in the Boston Public Schools. Julie currently serves as an educational consultant for digital media. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Christine and Mimi, for laying out the groundwork. What I want to do today is take you on the ground to a particular project. As Chris said, I directed three to third, which is um, three-year-olds to third graders. It was an initiative um, that the Harvard Graduate School of Education got involved in as, in partnership with Mayor Menino's office in Boston and Boston Public Schools. So our goal was to work in low-income schools to really try to narrow the achievement gap uh, with two main components. One was family engagement, and the other was using data to inform literacy instruction. But today, I'm going to talk about one aspect of family engagement, which is home visiting, which we saw as a catalyst for family engagement. I'll also say right from the start that we were surprised um, by the amount of discussion and um, controversy and interest and attention that the home visiting aspect um, of, our, of our project really garnered. We, were, we just thought it was one piece, but it was a piece that really caught on that people wanted to know more about. Um, and so let me tell you about it. So next slide, please. Okay, first we owe an enormous debt to the Sacramento home visiting model um, with Carrie Rose, who's their director, who came and did workshops um, for us, she and her staff, with parents who had been visited in Sacramento and teachers who had gone out and conducted the visit. And she really got us started. In Sacramento, home visits are from K through 12, which is really an ambitious program. And they at that time had been doing it for 10 or 12 years, so they were really experts and they, they were our mentors. We um, took the Sacramento model and adapted it. I'll tell you uh, more about that as we go, but the main thrust for us was uh, talking to parents about their hopes and dreams for their child, honoring parents as their child's first teachers, but also giving parents the tools they needed for literacy development at home. Our motto became, every point of contact with a parent is an opportunity to add to their skill set about literacy development. Uh, so that, you know, that's something that we um, struggled with and really tried to integrate, and uh, I, I, I'll tell you more about it. Um, we also talked with teachers about developing rapport with families. It's all about relationships. Families really felt that way, the teachers who went out to visit families uh, grew so much as professionals because they were able to establish these relationships with the home that they hadn't been able to do before through more traditional avenues such as open houses and phone calls and um, other types of chance meetings uh, at the buses before and after school. Uh, next slide, please. That was a visit, by the way, that photograph was with the teacher and a paraprofessional. Anyway, I'll move on. Um, we started, we talked with teachers about what made a successful home visit, and we got their ideas on this as well. So I mentioned to you before about the goals. It's establishing that relationship, honoring the parent, really showing the parent that the teacher cared a lot by going to the home. And I must say, that in, in some of our communities, like in East Boston, that are little communities, teachers could walk to a lot of their visits. But in other communities, like Roslindale, the child could live 45 minutes away from the school. So that was a really big time investment for the teacher. Um, getting back to goals, though, so another goal would be to introduce the Read Boston program, which is what this teacher in the 
uh, image that you have here is tracking student involvement in Read Boston, which is a program that one of our principal investigators, Rick Weisbord, had already established in Boston. So they became our sister organization, and we try to merge the two. And here you see that um, this um, family outreach coordinator is tracking their progress. And um, the Boston <laughs> the basketball fans might notice that the Boston Celtics were kind enough to champion this cause. And we were able to give students a lot of um, really juicy swag from the Celtics. But getting back to goals then, it's really all about literacy too. And as a major part of trying to narrow the achievement gap. We all want all of our students reading on grade level by third grade, starting with the very youngest students. So with that in mind, we gave teachers protocols for the visit and goodie bags. When you go to somebody's house, you bring a present. What did we bring? Books. Um, and some manipulatives, too. For young children, magnetic alphabet letters, sometimes fun word games and puzzles and so on. We supplied those to the school so that the teacher could just grab the goodie bags and run to the visit. The protocols were all about just the you know four or five major goals of the visit, not to be used in any way as a checklist, because we all know that clipboards and checklists are a real turnoff for parents, but so that the teacher would internalize the protocol and there would be continuity among visits. Um, Committing to the visit in writing, we really ask for teachers who are participating to say that they would make a good faith effort to visit every child in their classroom. And we found this was important because we all know that the school year gets to be very busy and some teachers were doing all their visits in the late summer if they had a class list and finishing up in the early fall. Other teachers might have only visited four or five families. And then, you know, it's getting dark out early in the east anyway, and they're not wanting to go and meet with those students, and they said they'll go in the spring. And that, that just really wasn't, wasn't working at all for anybody. So we really try up front to get that commitment from teachers that they're going to make a good faith effort, not just to visit the families they already know and have rapport with, but to dig deeper and visit the families who feel marginalized, who are bit harder to reach, who may not respond to the first, second, or third phone call or, or outreach. Uh, we also use a buddy system. Um, a lot of times uh, the teacher may have been bilingual or trilingual, but not have a language in common with the family that she was visiting. Oftentimes there was somebody else in the child's school environment who would go with that teacher and um, serve as an intermediary. We found that this was a way in which paraprofessionals, for example, felt that they were doing something so important because they, for example, would, may speak Vietnamese where the classroom teacher didn't, and they could form that bridge. And this was a new role for them and something that felt much more professional than a lot of the kinds of day-to-day um, -day sorts of tasks that paraprofessionals are charged with. Buddy system also came into play if the teacher felt in any way uh, that, that threatened by the visit, physically in any kind of physical danger, going out with a colleague um, who was also compensated for the visit uh, gave them confidence. We also said at all times, if you ever do feel threatened on your visit, just leave. You know, and that never happened, but that was always an option. The next. Uh, goal that we had was about stipends because this is a longer conversation than we can have today, but uh, unions uh, may not be keen on teachers going out on their own time. We compensated teachers at an hourly rate and after much debate determined that it was really um, a two-hour engagement per family because there are a lot of phone calls to set up the visit. Then you have to go to the visit, you do a little write-up when you come back, and all in all, it was really about a two-hour investment per family. Um, I should say, too, sometimes once the teacher got to the home, the family was so excited to have them there that they cooked dinner and, you know, it turned into a longer visit than they expected. But we always said it can be 45 minutes to an hour. It's up to you if you want to stay longer. Then the follow-up would be with the teacher 
taking notes for her eyes only on the visit and what sorts of follow-up she promised so that she would remember to get back to the family. For example, there's one school that had a winter coat drive. So if a family um, needed to know about uh, clothing that was available or a food pantry or special services within the community, the teacher would follow through on that. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, we conducted formative research with our teachers and um, parents and in the form of focus groups, interviews, questionnaires, and so on. And here's what we found. The P in all in parentheses below stands for parent and the T stands for teacher. That's our shorthand. So in with parents and teachers, they felt a shared commitment to the success of the child. We heard over and over the same language, we're on the same page. They used that exact phrase. We found it really interesting. We also heard from parents and teachers that communication improved drastically. Teachers felt like they could pick up the phone, call the parent, they had the parent's cell phone number, they could do check-in calls much more readily because they had developed a special rapport with them. Now, the whole child perspective, Teachers said to us over and over that they got to understand the child by seeing the child in the home. They could, uh, often the child wanted to show them their bedroom, their stuffed animals, their toys, and then the teacher, could, the teacher also saw them in relationship to other children in the household. Were they the middle child? Were they the child who was trying to get attention because there was a new baby? They're an older sibling who was really nurturing. Just gave them a whole brand new perspective. And from a literacy standpoint, it also allowed teachers to engage in um, deconstructive language with students about things beyond the here and now in the classroom. Um, Student-teacher relationship, both parents and teachers talked about that. From an instructional standpoint, um, teachers were able to talk to parents about dialogic reading and really interacting around books. A lot of parents really didn't grow up that way. Their people in their families may have done a great reading of a book. Many of them said to us, you know, I could read interactively with my child, but nobody ever told me before that that was important. I can do that. Um, so that, that was an important bonding sort of activity. And then behavioral and socio-emotional uh, situations became much more um, enlightened people had more perspective on what was going on with children and what the home was like and how teachers could be more effective in dealing with some of the challenges. For the parent-teacher relationship, there was a new level of comfort and a new level of trust. Um, I may also add that one of the big selling points for teachers, this was another surprise for us, was that they after they did a few visits, they got really excited about them and a major factor was the high regard in which the families held them. They were treated like royalty when they went on the visits and you know in this age of teacher bashing and teachers not receiving much respect in society, that was um, a really wonderful experience for them. They really saw how much parents appreciated them. One-to-one uh, -one attention coming from the parent, they're not very satisfied doing what schools often need to do for pragmatic reasons, which is to have parents come in and have a 10 or 15 minute conference. This way they have the teacher to themselves for an hour. Um, time, time, time is the teacher's comment, it's really tough doing these visits. I had one kindergarten teacher who went into um, her Vietnamese community in Dorchester with her Vietnamese speaking paraprofessionals and they did eight visits on a Saturday. So I mean that's the kind of dedication that we were seeing but it does take just huge amounts of time. And then language and culture, we found new understandings among teachers. Often they were hesitant going into families if they were not familiar with the culture and we encouraged them to not try to be an expert on every culture but to go in with openness and curiosity and talk to families about their cultural heritage and that, that seemed to work really well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So with this, because it's the real world and we know the real world is messy and not everything uh, works perfectly, these were some of the challenges we faced. And I can speak at another time to those of you who are interested about some of the solutions that we came up with. But getting everybody on board, um, the panelists before me talked about all the work that you have, all the layers of buy-in that you need to get before you start any initiative, and that was certainly true here. Um, we also saw it as a great opportunity to develop teacher leaders, so we worked with principals on that, and some leadership op opportunities came to the fore. Scheduling visits can be tough. Um, parents uh, in our communities uh, um, many times work three jobs. That's really tough for them to have the teacher come over. Um, sometimes parents weren't comfortable having the teacher come over, so we uh, encourage teachers to suggest a neutral site like a coffee shop or a park or a library. Anything that um, was neutral in that the teacher wasn't sitting behind her big fortress of a desk as the authority figure, and, and teachers understood exactly what we meant by that. Uh, the voluntary nature of the visit, uh, not all parents want to have teachers come and visit, not all teachers want to make a visit. So what do you do if four third, third grade teachers want to do this and one really isn't comfortable doing that, just isn't ready? Um, so that's a big dilemma. Implementing visits school-wide as part of the school culture is tough because schools often are not uh, very open to change. And I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm not being critical here. We all know that innovation is, the innovation and change are, are tough in, in um, various cultures. Resources for additional student services based on what teachers learned during the visit. Teachers couldn't always connect parents with exactly what they needed. Their communities um, have experienced a lot of budget cutbacks. So those English language lessons that were once free down in the community center may not exist anymore. Uh, linking home visits and other family engagement data to literacy achievement data by systematically tracking and analyzing the relationship. We really try to build a database whereby we could keep track of um, the parents who are agreeing to the visits, coming to conferences, and be really data driven around this. We didn't quite get the database working in a way that was easy enough for people to use. So we were we worked on that for many years and are still challenged by that. And then the last is rocking the system that I alluded to before. It's hard to go in and bring in a change in a school system and have everybody embrace it. That's it. And there are resources and so on on our soon to be launched website. And I hope you'll go and visit that and I hope you'll contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much, Julie. And as people um, look at the polling question, what barriers do we need to overcome? Um, to me, what Julie exemplified so beautifully um, is a commitment to outreach, really going beyond our traditional, often one-way information and communication with families to reach beyond the school walls to really connect the loop with families by engaging in two-way learning relationships, going beyond just sharing information with families about literacy, but actually um, caring enough to share actual tools that families can use with their children in supporting their literacy. And as the relationships developed over time, um, reaching out to learn more about family language, family culture as a way of enriching school-based practice, so really developing those two-way connections, those two-way learning relationships that are at the heart of what we do. Um, as we see, um, principals and administrators, um, people see those leaders as critically important to fully embrace families as partners, and I noticed we had several questions um, on the question board around this, which we will hopefully get to during our question and answer period. So as we continue to dig in deeper around um, practical actions, um, successful but challenging actions to really live out family engagement, we move now to a presentation on family school community partnerships by Mary Ellen Burns. Mary Ellen is the Vice President of Partner Relations for the United Way of San Antonio in Bexar County in Texas. So welcome, Mary Ellen. 
Thank you. And I'd like to begin by saying that we're really excited that this conversation is even taking place, this presentation is taking place. It's been our discovery that family engagement is really the critical missing piece in the uh, formula for school success, so that there's the fact that there's this conversation and there's all this work out there, we're all thinking about this in new ways, is uh, I think bodes well for the future. So Family School Community Partnership, we're going to focus on one aspect of our partnership, which takes place in an inner city district in San Antonio. And we're now in about 16 schools, but we're going to focus on the aspect of the role of parent rooms to rebuild parent engagement. And I say rebuild because parents are engaged with their children for the most part, but are they engaged with them in a way we need to be, for them to be engaged in our schools? Uh, next slide, please. All right. So. We're really talking about parent engagement here in San Antonio as transformation. And what you see in 2006 is we started out with a few schools and a few parents. And in the summertime, these parents would do some training and they did home visits. And they came back and said, here are what the parents in, in these six schools are most concerned about. The interesting thing is we got this report together, we gave it to the superintendent, and he said, you know, this is a great report, very interesting, very illuminating, but is there any way that I could speak to the parents directly? I, I just don't want to filter. I want to hear what they have to say. I want to be able to ask questions. And so could I speak with them? And they said, well, of course you could. So what we did was we started having, uh, he asked if he could have lunch with the parents twice a year. So we had, he has lunch with them in the fall and spring. And as you can see, that picture to the right is the parents having a conversation. And the next picture at the bottom is where we are today. These are parent leaders in the uh, 16 schools that the partnership now uh, is active in, and, and they really only represent about 80% of the parent leaders. If you look at these folks and, and you and think to yourself that they all have influence over at least 20 other parents, you can begin to understand the impact that these parent rooms have had on changing the culture in the schools of this inner city. The other thing that's important to know before we go on is in these schools, prior to this partnership, there were two or three parents occasionally that would uh, walk the hall. Next slide, please. So what is this transformation? I think we're going to the, okay, back up one slide if you don't mind. The transformation is in the parents. First of all, we meet the need by these home visits, parents doing the home visits. And I wanted to say something about the home visits earlier. I don't know how it's operating in your districts, but in an inner city school, especially in an economically distressed area, there's significant mobility. And when we get these lists, when the parents get the lists of the, for the home visits in the summertime, anywhere between 40 and 80 percent of the lists are wrong. The children don't live there anymore. However, because they're parents visiting other parents, they just ask their neighbors that they've seen at the local grocery store, well, where do they move? And the people tell them. So our, our uh, rate of actually reaching families is extremely high. And in fact, we then come, the parents then come back and tell the school, no, they don't live here, they live there, so that they can actually update their records. So it's been it's very, very effective. But in the course of those home visits, they find out what are the needs, what are the concerns. And in the, in the process of those parents doing the home visits, the parents transform into people who now see themselves as resources and as a critical liaison. These parent, these parent rooms and these home visits and this process of parents engaging parents allows people to find their voice again, find their confidence, rediscover their talents. And so this whole, and this, and this new discovery of really how great the need is in their own neighborhood next door that they never knew about. So this whole partnership idea, this parent room, which you're going to, bet you're going to see in the next slide, is about empowerment and about shared responsibility, and about promise. Next slide, please. So we started with these parent rooms. And basically, it's a, it's a converted classroom. And in, in the early days, there was a coffee pot and a crock pot. And we said to the parents, these are your rooms. You design them. So over time, they created these spaces that are community spaces. And I'm going to take, get, stop a minute and let you look at the kinds of activities the parents now engage in from under their own volition. They have, they have decided that based on the home visits and the concerns they've heard from parents, that these are the things they need to be doing. And I'll tell you that 
We've had all the schools design these slides that uh, depict a day in their lives, and they're all different. The key there is that every, every school community has its own personality, its own priorities. And so the flexibility here that remains is that in the home visit, those home visits, the conversations with the parents of that particular school are what drive the agenda and the focus of those parent rounds. Next slide, please. So this, this is a very interesting um, gift that the parents brought. All the parent rooms have been decorated with the personality of the parents. And, and what, they, what they've learned that they, that's important to do in the parent rooms is they bring a piece of their history. So many of the parent rooms have multiple cultures in the room. And this board is actually a picture of family members and mementos from their own lives that they're proud of. So it's about building each other up. And this, this happened naturally with the parents. Look closely at the children and at the, the artwork. That's all about people valuing each other and seeing each other as gifted. Next slide, please. Every parent room has a college corner. Parents had lots of questions about college, and so they all look different, but they all have information on where to turn. And we started, they started a project uh, several, about five years ago because they discovered the parents in their conversations with each other in this room discovered that children weren't dreaming about the future, so the parents are going to do something about that. Next slide. And of course, every parent room, because most of the parents uh, have someone at home still, they wanted a children's corner uh, so that even if they have a three or a two-year-old, they can doesn't stop them from coming into the school and being involved and being engaged in their elementary school child. Next slide. So take a look, a, a really good look at the curtains. The parent, all these kinds of supplies, most of them come from the parents' homes. They bring in a couch. Every parent room ended up having a couch so that it's comfortable and it's welcoming. And I, I don't know if you can see to the right behind the, the uh, woman in the purple, there's a computer. All the parent rooms have computers. And parents come and apply for jobs. They look online for children's grades. They teach each other actually how to turn on a computer. Um, but they're all there to say, Connect to the world, connect to your child, connect to the school, and you can do it here. Next slide. They have just simply become community spaces. Now, all the parent rooms, you can see the size. They're the size of a classroom. They'll put those tables up, and they'll hold a, hold a Zumba class. They'll, hold, uh, they'll do arts and crafts after school. They will do, they call in speakers. Depending on the questions that came up in the home visits, the parents will arrange for community speakers to come into that room and have a conversation, whether it's about special needs, about college, about summer activities. Um, it all happens in the parent room. Next slide, please. Just to kind of give you a sense of last year, these are the numbers the parents uh, have achieved, just under 3,000 parent-to-parent home visits. The interesting thing that we totally didn't expect were the volunteer hours. We were looking for volunteers. We were looking for engagement. And in the course, parents stepped up, stepped in, and uh, wouldn't go home. So uh, the other issue that we, of course, track is academics. And you can see the results there. We've just yesterday received our data for this school year and found out that in, in the schools in which these parent rooms and parent partnerships are conducted, attended up across the board. Next slide, please. So the challenges. Um, the parents in this empowerment process, they find their voice, they find their talents, they get on the computer, they find a job, and they're, and they're no longer able to come to school. We consider that a good problem. What we've done as a result is uh, we have developed a succession of parent leaders so that it's not all dependent on one head coach. And we have a team uh, approach to leadership so that they are free to, and we encourage them to go on uh, with their lives, with their education. Many, many, many of the parents, once they get into school and they are less intimidated by education, are deciding to complete their own edu education. In many cases, that's a GED, but in increasing number of cases, that's uh, including community college and four-year colleges now. Uh, the second bullet is, was a surprise. 
uh, I don't know what your perception or experience is with underperforming schools, but you've got hardworking teachers. And yet, in some cases, there are teachers, and there are the minority, who over time expect to go home at 3.30, do not expect people to be asking questions, do not expect to be doing tutoring and mentoring. And this, the challenge we've had with this partnership is that parents understand the process and find their voice, and they, they track on their children's uh, progress in school. They go to the teacher, and they ask for more, and they ask for more help. And we get some pushback on that. The, the last challenge is uh, principal turnover. You, you find the principal uh, is engaged. They understand the process. They, they're changing the culture of campus. The campus does well. What happens? Well, the principal gets moved to a campus that's not doing well. And you're starting over with a whole new principal, and it's a whole new day, and it can be very, very disruptive. Next slide. That's it. So back to you, Chris. Alrighty, um, I'm figuring out a few responses here. It's hard to know exactly where to dig in, and I see we've had a uh, long list of fabulous questions, so I will just uh, make a few comments as we move forward um, after our polling questions and get in and dig in on these great questions. Um, so given the wealth of um, possibilities that have really been portrayed, particularly in the last two presentations, um, and sort of the wealth of possibilities I'm seeing come through our questions, what is the first step you could envision that would um, make sense for your school or center to improve family engagement, particularly with that focus across the pre-K through third grade spectrum? Um, as I listened to Mary Ellen, um, I just was so struck by the um, acknowledgement of parents as people or family members as people um, and the depth of the level of support that the San Antonio Project placed in parents and families, um, both to really construct what they needed and would find most meaningful as they began to engage more fully in schools, and also really to think in a two-generational way around not only what um, would be most supportive through family engagement for children, but also most supportive for um, the adults. And as we look at um, the polling responses, certainly supporting home visits looks like a really important place that's perceived to be meaningful by many respondents. Um, and again, really trying to build those partnerships across settings, um, such as you've seen heard talked about in our presentation. So as we move forward, um, before we take on questions and um, present those to our presenters for today, um, we can move forward slides. One more. There. Um, five C's. It seems like in education, early childhood education, we always come up with three or four or five C's of something. And as I was um, reading the slides before today's presentations and, and listening um, with such pleasure to the presentation, it seemed to me that five C's really captured um, the sort of bottom line message we were getting for from presenters as we think about moving forward. Um, as we think about family relationships, most of us have always really um, aspired to having caring relationships with families. But I think what we heard today is that as we think about those caring relationships as essentials, we really want to redefine what caring means and move to a um, more intensive, intentional level. Um, the concept of relational trust, which has um, been suggested by Burke and others, really sums up to me what we heard today. Um, it's not just caring. It's about trusting um, and respecting family members enough to really listen to and respect their opinions um, and take action based on those opinions. Um, it's about showing personal regard by going per, um, beyond what perhaps may be the formal requirements of the job to leave the school building, to go out into the community and families, um, homes, to learn more and to engage in productive relationships with families. Um, it's also about being creative. One thing we know is all of our lifestyles um, have changed um, over the past very few years, um, and the old models don't always work. Um, so I heard people being very creative, not getting stuck on what doesn't work, but really thinking creatively about how can we really move forward with rich and meaningful relationships with families. Um, I love the parent-to-parent -parent outreach through home visits, which again goes back to the issue of trust, trusting families um, and being creative to think about families connecting with others, not only on the school grounds, but also reaching out to through those home visits. Um, continuous, again, I think um, 
Christine started with focusing on the need to think about more continuous. Um, so often we focus on activities, all of which are essential ways to live our, out our beliefs about family engagement. But what I saw um, across the presentations today was thinking about activities and engaging in activities with families as a means to a broader end. Um, as a means to really having families much more engaged um, in their children's literacy development, as we heard from Julie, um, as a means to really learning from families about their home culture, their home li literacy practices, to have that inform our practices as we go back to our school settings, again from Julie, um, about tracking progress making sure over time that we're moving somewhere with our relationships rather than, as Christine said, getting stuck on one-time projects or activities. Um, certainly culture, as the fourth C, cut across all of the presentations today. We started with the idea of shifting our professional cultures to really rethink um, the role of collaboration, collaboration not only among ourselves as colleagues, collaboration across programs, bringing the traditional culture um, early childhood together with the traditional culture, professional cultures of K-12 and blending them into some new hybrid that really fits the needs of children, staff, and families more productively, but certainly family culture um, and respect um, and a need to understand and work with families through their own family cultural lenses came through loud and clear um, as we looked at the practices people were espousing today. And finally, um, the fifth C, the idea of collective responsibility. Um, it always sounds so wonderful, but it's so hard to achieve, especially in today's context, which often um, focuses on placing blame on someone else. Um, I heard about teacher resistance, I think, I think from Mary Ellen, from someone, teacher resistance or initial teacher resistance to um, going out in the community. I heard about administrator resistance. But again, when we look at that attitude of we're all in this together, um, how can we begin to talk with families, work with families, so we all are in this together? And that I think so that we as educators really recognize that not only do families benefit and children benefit, but our overall program capacity and just our own lives as educators are really enriched um, in our capacity to really um, provide education that matters are all enriched by this idea of collective responsibility. So moving quickly to the next slide, um, I thought of several questions. Clearly everyone who tuned in today is um, concerned, interested, and hopefully excited about new prospects, transformation, as Mary Ellen talked about. Um, so we all have very different starting places of what makes sense for the um, next step in our own progress toward really rethinking and enriching family engagement in pre-K through third. Um, clearly a question that our um, pre presenters challenged all of us with is how can we reach beyond the center and school walls to connect with families? Um, how can we physically perhaps reach beyond the center and school walls? Um, if not physically, how can we nevertheless reach out to both give that message of we want to learn from you and learn with you as we move forward on behalf of children, but also to share um, tools as our home visitors did with families, and to receive information that enables us to more fully um, connect with children and connect children's lives into our classroom um, teaching and learning. Um, perhaps some of my students, um, I'm an old school person, but some of my students are now teaching, about, teaching me about Skyping and social media connections with families. So um, how can we reach out beyond the school walls to make those connections? Um, how can we cultivate the two-way learning relationships that we heard about across the presentations. Um, I think it was Julie's presentation talked about getting to know families and hopes and dreams for children. But how can we intentionally, not just incidentally, but intentionally find ways to connect the loop, to listen to families as much as we talk with families, and begin to really move in concrete ways toward those shared goals or collective responsibility. Um, and I think it doesn't always take a lot to do a lot of good. Um, I know my own teachers over the last number of years before I left the school um, started conferences and home visits with a simple question about what goal is most important for um, your child this year as you start first grade? Um, and so very often it's just opening the door to hearing from families who 
very often are not asked, but very often are very eager to tell their stories, and particularly the stories of what they want for their children. I think we were also challenged to think about how each of us um, can build in intentional ways to more fully understand and embrace family strengths and their funds of knowledge. I know one of our questions talked about how can we bring in um, families' home literacy practices to the classroom. So again, it's, it's really how can we reach out and find ways to, to learn more and to understand more over time, not just because that's a good thing to do and a um, very rewarding thing to do, but because it will, in fact, lead back to stronger learning outcomes for children in the context of our practices. Um, big question, and as we talked about passions being both positive and sometimes um, conflictual, how can we individualize family connections? Just as with children, we know that not every approach works for every family. So I think our challenge is to be as cognizant about individual differences and respectful of individual differences as early educators we are for children and extend that mindset to families. Um, and then finally, how can we build comprehensive two-generational school family supports? So many of our families who are living in stressful communities um, experience economic and other life challenges um, can benefit from connections with stronger resources. Again, we heard um, Mary Ellen's dilemma of having parents graduate from their program for the very good reason that they um, advance their own education and their own um, employment opportunities as a part of connecting with their children's schools. And what better way to um, serve our children than to serve their children as well. So thanks to our presenters for um, at least those messages that I took away. Just as a very um, quick final note, I know one thing we wanted to really highlight was um, our experience with Title I as the Elementary Secondary Education Act, all of us know um, more intimately these days as No Child Left Behind, has historically um, had parent involvement policies, procedures, and funds, um, and set aside funding for schools to support parent, what um, in that legislation tends to be called parent involvement. And I think we need to all go back, both of us who work within K-12 systems, and take a look at what's really happening under um, Title I auspices within our districts, within our schools. Um, one question not listed here is, are we using the opportunity to invest Title I funds in early education, the early years before um, K-12 education? But more importantly, are we really um, sort of nudging our districts and nudging ourselves within the context of schools to move beyond compliance. I know my um, own experience as a school administrator was very often um, that the requirements under Title I, such as a parent-student um, parent school compact, school -based, having a school-based parent involvement policy, um, having a school report card, all of the things that are required under No Child Left Behind, Title I, were very often um, sort of looked at as a checklist. I need to do a cut and paste and pluck up my uh, parent involvement policy from last year's school, and school improvement plan and paste it into this year's. And I guess what all of us uh, want to take a look at are these living documents going back to the question of it's great to have policies, it's great to have plans, but yet it's um, the educators at the ground level that turn them into meaningful. So look at how we can turn those requirements into living documents, living processes, means toward a larger end. And I think within Title I, um, again, this is a message I heard across the presentations today, is how can we be more intentionally inclusive um, within Title I and also within most of our um, aspirations for parent involvement. Um, we want families to be involved in decision making. But yet we know for a lot of for a lot of us we find that many families' voices are not readily heard. So I think one of our challenges is to be intentionally inclusive, to seek out families, all families. Um, I loved that the home visits, um, I think, that Mary Ellen talked about were universal, every child, every family. Um, but seek out all families, especially those whose voices are not readily heard, and to make sure that we build capacity, the empowerment that was talked about, so that, again, all families um, can find meaningful ways of engagement and meaningful ways to be empowered as those um, 
other teachers of their children. So with that said, more importantly, I would like to turn to questions, and we'll take as many questions. So what I will do is take questions that were posed um, during the dialogue, during the presentations, and pose them to specific presenters. So here we go. Um, Julie, I think I would like to target you for this. And if anybody else uh, would like to join in, just uh, type me a little note, and we can move to new, you next. Um, question came through on how to engage families who are illiterate and of low socioeconomic status. And as a part of this, um, what strategies did you all use to build upon the existing lit home literacy processes of families, particularly as you think about immigrant families who may have alternate visions of what family engagement um, and working with professionals might look like. Make sense, Julie? Here, I'm tossing right. it to you. Yes. I, I, uh, let's see. I think we tried a number of things. We have one school that had a family engagement coordinator who had ha still has breakfast for parents once a week, and they come in and teachers um, rotate uh, giving workshops for the parents. So one teacher might, in English and Spanish, a bilingual teacher, um, talk to families about what a book report is and use an example of, um, you know, I can think of one session where she used the uh, biography of Diego Rivera that, that was a book where she then drew out parts uh, of it that a child would be expected to respond to in a book report format. So it's always taking the parents from wherever they are, um, providing translations whenever possible, which isn't always possible in you know extremely diverse language um, neighborhoods. Uh, we mostly worked with Vietnamese, Spanish-speaking, Brazilian, and uh, Portuguese-speaking and Haitian Creole families. So. It wasn't the range that you would get, say, in New York City. But anyway, to try to accommodate language whenever possible, bring the parents in, just show them. Always be building up their skill set of um, how teachers think about literacy development and then what they're teaching them and how they can reinforce this at home. And you're right. Uh, whoever wrote the question, you know, parents often feel marginalized from schools because they feel that their education um, ended abruptly or wasn't up to par and it's again the job of all of us to find as many ways as possible to bring them in. One um, a, a winner sort of format is to have children perform and I think in, across cultures that's something that parents find really critical. So you get them in through a performance of poetry, singing, dressing up like their favorite character from a book and then you say and while you're here Let's talk about um, you know how to how to read interactively with your child and ask good questions along the way. Not to be uh, do a bait and switch, but to again once you have the parents already in the school, to really work with them and give them some tools and send them away with some things that they can do at home. I don't know if that does that answer it. I think that it did a superb job. Thanks, Julie. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Um, Next question, and I think I'm going to toss this to Christine because she offered. Um, I'm going to actually pop up a couple of questions in hope of getting our um, the biggest bang for the buck here. Um, I'm sorry, that's Mary Ellen. I think I misspoke. Um, one question that came through is how can community-based organizations work with school administrators to increase family engagement. I know you talked to some, Mary Ellen, about um, working with the superintendent on down and clearly had 14 partner schools. So that link between community-based organizations with schools to increase family engagement. Um, then I know you have a lot to say about how we get beyond the walls of the school and center to really engage families. And then finally, I know we had a few very concrete, specific questions about how to finance parent centers and schools. So hopefully that's not too garbled, and I will toss it to you, Mary Ellen. OK, first of all, the community partners. We actually have two community partner agencies, Family Services Association and Presa Community Center, who are ma the ma we call the managing partners of this family school community partnership. They each have seven schools. And they um, initially, in the early stages of the parent partnership at a campus, hire staff. And the staff recruit the parents, and, and then the, 
the, we get the parent leadership training going, and the objective is, and what's happening, is that as the parents step up and are in, uh, equipped with the skills they feel uh, make them ready to be leaders in the parent room, the staff step out. So the cost over time per, per school goes down. The community-based organizations are now coming to the parent rooms and saying, we've been here for years. We are not uh, successfully connecting or communicating with families. Can you be the bridge for us? So the parents are really sort of sick shopper uh, marketers. And so they, they are walking around with an ever-expanding list in their pockets and saying, oh, you need this? This is the agency that's in town that can do it. Uh, in a, we're a United Way. We have a two-on-one system. but. It's still the best kept secret in town. People are not calling that as much as, uh, especially in the stressed neighborhoods, like we had hoped they would. So now the parents are equipped to connect parents to resources. And I'm telling you, they are also tough. If, if they find a community partner that is not welcoming to families, they will not recommend it. So it's very interesting. On the Beyond the Walls, I did want to say something um, about the voices and the marginal, um, the sense of being marginalized as families. We have found um, two things to be true. One is that in, in our community as well, there's a, a huge language barrier. And so very early in the process, uh, at the request of parents, we purchased simultaneous translation systems. And so no meeting is held in one language. And parents are doing the translating. So, so that and the, the message that sounds to, sends to, to parents is one of not just communication, but of respect. You really are welcome here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was, that in this, whoever spoke about parents being intimidated because they did not have a, a successful or positive experience in school themselves, we found that as well. And what we sort of have this unwritten rule of catching parents when they're doing something right, and that's the beginning of a relationship and a conversation. That these parent, the parents, the grandparents, the caretakers, whoever is caring for the child, have so many assets and skills that aren't identified, go unacknowledged, uh, and so they, don't, they stop seeing it in themselves. But when we have found, when we see them, a teacher spots something and mentions it, that parent looks the teacher back in the eye and says, well, thank you, and now I have a question for you. So the conversation begins. So in terms of going beyond the walls, the, this partnership, the, the parent room may be the focus, this is really the beginning of, of community rebuilding. And there's lots of things happening beyond the walls. The parents, when someone, there's a death in the family, and this is a very economically distressed neighborhood, the parents uh, conduct fundraisers, barbecues, uh, in their homes to raise funds for the funeral. I can go on and on, on with the list of things. But the churches are very, uh, they, they reach out to the churches, and they bring the churches into the room. Did you know about this? Did you know about this? They are the connectors, the bridge builders, the sh secret shoppers. They're the community. And, the, and, and in terms of whose, whose conversation is this to have, this, this is the community of parents and the families. And we're the guests. And we're trying, all we've done here is, is create the opportunity for the relationship, and then we got out of the way. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm watching time. I think we have time for two more questions. If each person who responds to a question takes, tries to sum it up in about three minutes or slightly less. Um, this is a question, um, I think, building upon what Mary Ellen just shared um, for Christine. Um, again, sort of starting with that idea that the passion runs strong as we think about engaging with families, um, both sort of the, the very positive end of the spectrum and sometimes very challenged, um, frustrating end of the spectrum spectrum. And we had one family coordinator who talked about ways that we can really support families in sort of embracing the idea of themselves as really important teachers in their children's lives, as you talked about children having multiple teachers. So I wondered if you would talk about that, Christine, just quickly building upon Mary Ellen, and also um, shout out how a local group that has done a lot of work over time on um, constructing a family engagement policy with families can now connect with a national organization to see themselves as part of this broader initiative. Christine? Sure. I, I think I think one thing that that we can do is is ask families to observe what they're doing with their children or take pictures or videotape their interactions with their kids and then reflect on those interactions. I think oftentimes 
for those families who don't see themselves as teachers don't often see those opportunities and those day-to-day -day interactions with their kids as learning moments. So I think by asking them to intentionally observe those moments and what happens um, in terms of the, the child's responses is, is an important first step. So, you know, I think that positions families to see themselves as teachers and, and also speaks to another role as, as data gatherers. They, they can observe and then reflect on what's happening in the home and the casual spaces in which they interact with their kids in day-to-day in -day circumstances. Okay, um, and I'll just kind of fill in. I think if um, our group with the local um, parent policy, family engagement policy that constructed, goes back and takes a look at Christine's reference list, that will connect you to a number of possible resources um, through Harvard Family Research um, Project um, to connect with a broader network. One final question for Mimi. Um, in looking at um, sort of really building those bridges from the early childhood community um, to the K-12 world, um, very often there are incentives built in, such as through Head Start, um, for those early childhood programs to support family engagement and family transition. We have a um, participant who's wondering what K-12 incentives might be there to really connect both with the early childhood programs and also um, with families. I'm wondering if you might address that knowing um, your engagement with the federal community and, and building the Head Start transitions. Sure. Um, well, I think uh, you mentioned number one. It's not an incentive, but it's a permission, if you will. Um, the, the new Title I instructions, I think, really do clarify what what a lot of what schools can do. And I think many times, in terms of family engagement and just creating more linkages back with the early learning programs and communities, a lot of it has to do with just not being clear on what what's really appropriate and what's okay to do. Um, under the guise of Title I. So that would be uh, one thing I would say. It's not an incentive, as I said, but it's more, um, it's an excuse for um, doing that. Uh, that being said, I think the other incentive, strong incentive that I have heard from people who have worked in schools is that what really kind of grabs and gets the, uh, the attention of principals and administrators at the district level is is the data on, on school readiness and the importance of what happens in those first grades, first through third grade, uh, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade in terms of really setting the stage and, and building what somebody has called the base camp for later learning. So I think really um, appealing to that sort of notion that, the, that, that, is, that those years are so important and that they really can make a difference. I think a lot of the new research and old research that's coming out around brain development and the importance of the early years from birth through age eight is also pretty compelling to principals and I guess and to teachers. And I guess the last thing I would say that I have heard is that I think a huge incentive for getting getting the K-12 people involved is just providing them with some support, some ongoing professional development, some training. Um, the kinds of giving them kinds of information that they can use so that they feel more comfortable dealing with the early learning community and with early learning programs either in their buildings or in their in their communities per se. Thank you, Mimi, so much. You are. Then, um, as we, thank you so much. As we transition forward, I um, really regret that our time is running out. Um, a final question, um, just to get some feedback from you all as to how um, meaningful today's presentation. And as we um, do that um, and get some feedback, I do want to make sure that we express appreciation to our incredible presenters. Um, and then as we move forward through the slides, you'll see that an archived version of this webinar will be posted on the pre-K through third grade national work group website within the upcoming days. And that we also have an upcoming webinar, as you recall, this is the third in an eight-part series of webinars. Um, our next webinar focuses on standards, not so sim simple standards and their implementation, and is scheduled to air on June 20th. So there will be a slide coming up to show that, but also just know that if you go to our Pre-K 3rd National Work Group website, that information will be there. And I think that concludes our day.
Ah, here's the information for your national work group, our next webinar, and again, the registration for that June 20th webinar will open in two weeks. Again, on the pre-K third grade national work group behalf, thank you to, to our presenters for bringing your passion and your expertise to all of our viewers today, our participants, and thanks particularly to all of our participants for taking time in your busy days um, to think about the next steps in promoting family engagement in pre-K third. Thanks and have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful upcoming weeks as we move to the next webinar. Thank you. Ah, we will tee up the last polling question and have three minutes left. There we go. Um, so agree and agree, which is good news. Um, keep your comments coming. We had a number of questions that we couldn't respond to, but um, we really appreciate your participation. Thanks, and have a great afternoon.